Good morning, scholars. Welcome back to Asylum. I'm a bit farther behind, or farther away from the camera than usual because the light shining through. As you can see, it'll be quite bothersome. So uh, I'll have to be forward extra far so that you guys can see any of the pictures that pop up. Uh, anyway, we are in chapter 21. Page 180. Okay. How are you guys doing? I drank some more water and I went up to the garden to get some leaky tea. So I'm a, I'm a bit more alert. But my head still hurts. I should have taken some medicine. Anyway, Dan was looking into the yawning void. Oh, great. How far under the earth did this place go, anyway? The cold rushing up from the space below was shocking. His sweatshirt wasn't close to being warm enough. We should have brought uh, a dang parka. And couldn't they have built the stairs a little wider? A safety inspector would have a heart attack. These stairs were steep, narrow, and had a sheer drop on both sides, with only a tiny pole of railing to hold on to. Clutching the rail with one hand and his flashlight in the other, Dan took the first step. Three stairs, four, ten. At fifteen steps, he reached a small landing. But he still couldn't see the floor with his flashlight. Just more and more stairs, which that a nightmare should find, leading into the bowels of the basement. One more landing, twelve more steps, and, uh, and at last he reached the bottom. Dun, dun, dun. He shined his flashlight up and around, watching as the meager light failed to find the, the top or even sides of what? A cave? A vault? He couldn't be sure, but he could tell it was enormous. Coughing, he listened to the sound bounce and echo for a solid minute before finally fading away. He slowly walked forward into the huge space. There were wooden posts that ran from the floor to the ceiling, otherwise um, the hall he was in seemed completely empty. Finally, he reached a square arch leading into yet another space beyond. Dan suddenly felt like laughing. He had been creeped out by the expansiveness of the cell level and the warden's secret office, but this was something else. Something he could hardly fathom. Hey Heath, there's something wrong with you. Even as his eyes were fed, the, uh, uh, or fed him the information, it was like a palace down here. What could it have been used for? But this was the last room. It had to be. Shining his light all around, he had a rusted metal box screwed into the wall beside him and he carefully nudged open the front panel. The rusty hinges squealed and the echoes in the chamber reverberated endlessly. He hit the jackpot. There were switches in the box and lots of them. Dan flicked the biggest one and was rewarded with a low hum, then a buzz, and finally a quiet pop as the lights came on. Only a few worked, and one exploded overhead in a shower of glass and sparks. Dan ducked instinctively and then gasped. He was looking down into an operating amphitheater. Ah, I hate those things. Did you guys ever uh, read a series of unfortunate events? There was an operating amphitheater, uh, like what we're about to see when I turn the page. Uh, something about a, drain, um, a, a brain transplant. Anyway. In the very middle of the room was a raised wooden platform, and standing dead center was an operating table. It was covered with a smooth sheet, originally white, now gray with dust. There was a padded pillow at the top. Leather straps buckled, transected um, the bed. Around the main table stood a few smaller tables on wheels. They had surgical instruments on them. Encircling the platform were steep, or stepped rows of chairs like in a sports arena, the stands, as if um, watching someone's surgery was some kind of amusement. With a sickening lurch, Dan realized he'd seen this room before, too. In another nightmare, in his dream, he'd started out on that table. He moved slowly down the stands, drawn to the platform. He walked a complete circle around it, his eyes never leaving the table. How many killers had been treated here? Had little Lucy been strapped down for surgery while people watched? 
the end, not of a scar on her forehead that suggested a lobotomy. If it had been that, and she had survived, poor little Lucy wouldn't have had much of a life. Why on earth would an operating amphitheater built, be, uh, be built so far underground? Are they concealing something? A small desk and filing cabinet at the very back of the room caught Dan's eye. They'd both been pushed into the shadows as if they wanted to be overlooked. Dan's heart raced. If patients were operated on Dan, if Lucy Valdez had been operated on, there would surely be records of it. If he was lucky, those records might not have gotten lost in the shuffle when Brooklyn closed. But as he approached the cabinets, his head felt, head felt suddenly heavy, like it had been stuffed with you. It blinked once, twice. The floor didn't feel so sturdy anymore. He stood over the table, ready, confident. This was his moment. He had an audience, and he would not disappoint them. This was his chance to prove that his methods, however unorthodox, worked. He was the warden. The warden, sorry. The warden. The warden, the trusted father of the Brookline family, strict but ultimately fair. Daniel looked down at his clean white coat and the instruments in his hands, sanitized and gloomy. Everything was prepared. X craned as each man tried to get a better look. Get a better look. Before him, strapped to the operating table, was, was a young boy who liked to set fires. Like Dan, Daniel blamed there was someone new, someone else who needed fixing. A cruel widow had poisoned six husbands, a pretty young girl with fiery red hair. Blinking again, he found the most wretched creature of all. He looked at the man's waxy face, slack now from the sedatives. This man was broken, but he wouldn't be broken for long. He could be fixed. They could all be fixed. Dan, the warden, started. Sudden sounds, a pounding like thunder, footsteps overhead. His vision blurred, spinning out of control. Not now. They couldn't come to him now. The authorities would never understand what he was trying to do. Dun, dun, dun. Dan, Dan, they were calling his name now. They were coming for him. Dan, hello, Dan, are you alright? You're scaring me. Snap out of it. Snap, snap, snap. Dan was cold all over and realized with a jolt that he was lying on the floor. Happy's face materialized above him and through the fading blur of the vision. For a moment he was relieved but then he felt instantly ashamed. What would she think if she could see inside his head? And then, operating table, I'm assuming. Uh, chapter 22. It's not that long. It's me, Abby said. She was kneeling beside him. It's okay, you're all right now. You're all right. How long have I been out? He said, touching a sore spot on his head where he must have pumped it. He saw that he was on the floor near the file cabinet, surrounded by scattered papers. I don't know, she said. I just got here and you were lying on the ground. She looked so concerned that it made him feel better, and maybe it was the relief of seeing her worried face, or the relief that it was her and not some ghost of the past made real. He had didn't know and didn't care, but suddenly he reached up, pulled her in, and kissed her. Half forward. It surprised them both. And me. Oh. Well, Abby breathed. She tasted like Altoids and cherry lip balm. I guess we could stop pretending to hate each other now, huh? I guess so, Dan replied. She smiled up down at, uh, up down him, I don't know, what? And can we just pretend I never said that stuff about you being a weirdo? Wait a minute, what stuff? He asked. Abby swatted him lightly on the chest. As nice as it was to see her smiling and laughing again, Dan really didn't remember her calling him a weirdo. Had he blocked that up? Or did she mean she'd said it to some of her art friends? The Ash. <laughs> anyway. Dan shook his head. He wasn't going down that road. Not anymore. He had kissed her, and it was as good as he could ever hope. 
We should get out of here, Abby said. This place gives me the creeps. She helped Dan get up. His head hurt, and he felt more than a little dizzy. Hey, he said suddenly. What are you doing down here anyway? Abby looked a little embarrassed. Well, I went to your room after dinner just to see you and apologize for the way I've been acting. You weren't there, so I got worried that you'd come down here by yourself. I guess I just wanted to make sure you were okay. Dan reached out and took Abby's hand, and she gave it a squeeze. Check that it's working. They walked up the steps, rows, back up, but stopped Dan, stopped to flick off the lights. He turned around and took uh, one more look at the now dark chamber. Two bright spots glowed from the far corner. Just the trick of the eye. Just the just imprints of the light bulbs left behind. Not the eyes of men watching. Dan shut the door quickly behind him. What's the holdup? Abby asked. Dan moved next to her, shaking his head. Nothing, he said softly. Nothing. Let's just get out of here. Are you hungry? I've got some amazingly stale snack cakes up in my room. Sounds delicious, Abby said, leaning into him. It's a date. Enjoying yourself, Abby? The heck was that? Okay. I think one more chapter ought to be fine. Chapter 23. When they got to the final door, Dan felt he was done with the basement for good. What mattered now was Abby and how warm her hand felt in his own. They would fix things with Jordan, and he would finish the summer with his best friends out in the sun's, uh, sunshine, away from all this gloom. Dan's euphoria was short-lived. Something had gone terribly wrong on the first floor. Police were swarming everywhere, and the entrance hall was flooded with students. One girl was uh, crying hysterically. The lights made Dan's uh, eyes hurt after the blackness of the basement. Exchanging a worried glance, Dan and Abby did the best of legend with the crowd. A tall police officer crossed in front of them, almost bumping into them. He barely spared them a glance and rapidly moved across the hall, shoulder and stooping out of the way. The crowd parted for him slowly. He reached the crying girl and took her by the shoulders, talking to her gently. What the? Dan and Abby tried to see what was going on, but the crowd was just too dense to move more than a few feet. Another police officer rushed in through the front door. Dan could see the flapping blue and red lights of the police cars parked outside. It looked like there were four or five of them. Move out of the way, the officer wondered. This is a crime scene. Move outside now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Apparently it was a she. I don't know. She and the tall policeman started hurting the kids outside the um, onto the lawn. Anyway. The students shuffled slowly, bottlenecking at the front door. Oh. Dan and Abby moved along with the crowd, following the officer's instructions. Police? Abby whispered. The color had drained from her face. Let's try to find out what happened. Outside, a third policeman was now talking to the crying girl. Everyone stood in groups, conversing in hushed whispers. Dan finally spotted E and Jordan. Jordan didn't look too good. He glared at Dan and Abby that disappeared into the crowd. What's going on? Dan asked. He looked at Dan in surprise. Your roommate found a dead guy on the stairs. One of the hall monitors, Jake, George, Joe, Dan blurted out. Abby covered her mouth. Yeah, that's it, Joe. Your boy Felix was coming back from a late night run up and found him. It looked like it looked it looked like he'd been dead for out uh, for a while. Sorry. A while couldn't have been that long, surely. Dan had seen Joe in the halls just before he went into the basement. That was, what, an hour ago? Maybe less? Dan needed to figure out how long he'd been down there. He was saying, at least that's what it looked like when I saw him. You saw him? Abby said, horrified. He nodded. Just a glimpse after Felix started screaming, eyes open, wide open, just staring. It was so freaking creepy. Jordan saw him, too. Joe was standing, propped up on the stairs with one hand on the railing, another holding his cell phone. His cell phone. Like a sculpture. Hey, he said suddenly, staring at them both. Where were you guys, anyway? How is it you didn't know? Who 
we weren't doing anything, Abby said, with good faith, and then she glanced up at Dan. Yes, he said. That sounded as guilty as you think it did. Dang it. All right, fine, you were right. She looked at her feet. We were making out, okay? Dan wasn't going to argue with that exaggeration. He liked it a lot, in fact. It was a clever cover, too. This way no one would know they'd actually been exploring the old wing. Yeah. And the old wing, he asked. Abby shrugged. You two are weird as never do. He muttered, then he said, You know, I'm worried about Jordan. Seemed to have definitely freaked him out. I mean, it's freaked out all of us, but he wasn't looking too good before. These days he hardly talks to me, and he's always working on math that I'm pretty sure is not even for a class. Do you think his nightmares are getting to him? Abby asked. Yeah, he keeps waking up in the middle of the night, and I think there might be stuff with his parents, like they found out he was here or something. Anyway, I get the feeling it's way worse than he's letting on. I just hope he's got a place to go back to. You know? He paused. Are you two keeping an eye on him? Abby and Dan exchanged a worried look. Since they'd all gone their separate ways, they had no idea that Jordan had gotten this bad. Dan felt guilty. He should have checked on Jordan, even though Jordan had withdrawn. Yeah, we're keeping an eye on him, Dan said. They are now, anyway. More policemen arrived. They began sectioning off the students and arranging them in, the, in smaller, more manageable groups. Probably for interviews. 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 Man, why did he feel so guilty? Dan, buddy, you feeling okay? You just got a little green. He punched, him, punched his arm lightly. Me? I'm fine. What are you talking about, Abby demanded, looking up at him. Clearly, none of us are fine. Two cops, the tall one and the police officer had moved everyone outside, reached where they were standing and herded their group over to a tree. Better come up with a believable story before Mulder and Scully over there get, uh, get a go at you. You don't want them knowing you are in the forbidden zone. He turned to talk with another kid, but Dan could hardly move. What if he was right? What if they were really going to be interrogated? Of course they're going to question you. Someone was murdered. We weren't in the old wing, Dan said, grabbing at his arm. You were in the second floor lounge, the one by your room. We have to get a story straight or they might think we had something to do with... with... He couldn't bring himself to say it. Okay. But we weren't anywhere near the second floor. She looked at him strangely. Why would we need a story? He took her by the forearm, tugging her away from the other students. Just trust me, okay? Think about it. We were both out wandering late at night. Joe's a big guy, so they probably won't suspect you to overpower him. But the two of us... Hey, I resent that, Abby said, yanking her arm out of his grasp. I might be uh, a little on the petite side, tiny. Whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah, and I'm stronger than I look. I mean, it's not like you're some kind of muscle-bound cult. So I don't see why you'd be a suspect and I wouldn't. Why are we arguing about this? You're Wonder Woman, okay? You're... Say I'm Black Widow. What? Abby, say it. She crossed her arms, talking one hip to the side. You're Black Widow, times ten. Happy? Jeez, why aren't you more freaked out? I am freaked out, Abby squeaked, giving him a little shot. I'm seriously freaked out. This is what I do when I'm freaked out. I babble, inanely. I babble inanely to distract myself from the freaking out. I do this too. Okay, okay. He hoped nobody had heard that. They both sounded guilty, even if they weren't. Well, not guilty of murder, just guilty of having poor judgment and a blatant disregard for loose curfew rules. He knew that at least, right? Poor Felix. I hope he's not too traumatized, she said, turning um, to search the crowd. Do you see him? No, Dan said. I'm sure he's being questioned by the police. Gird your loins? What? He was back. He slid up to them, popping out of the corner of his mouth. I got Mulder and Scully on my six. What does that mean? Like behind it? Dan took a deep breath, preparing to unleash a whole mouthful of nothing on officers of the law. They separated him from Abby, the police woman taking her aside while Dan went with the tall guy. 
The whole process was surprisingly quick and painless. He was asked uh, standard questions, where he was, what he heard, what he saw, and if he could remember any strangers around the dorm that day. Dan answered vaguely, mentioning he was on the second floor with his friend, that he had seen Joe earlier that day, but hadn't noticed anyone suspicious loitering in Brookline. Thanks, the cop told him when the questions ran out. Did you see anything strange? Anything at all out of the ordinary, you tell someone. Okay, son? Okay. Thanks, sir. Dan wanted to wait, no. He just lied through his teeth to a cop. Why? Exploring the basement wasn't the same as murder. It just wasn't. He had to keep reminding himself of that over and over again. Forget about your freaking alibi. Whoever did this is still out there. The officer finished speaking to Abby a moment later. As Dan waited for her, he heard one of the cops talking to another in tones. Probably some bum, he was saying. They're almost getting a flying drunk and wandering up onto the campus. We'll find him in a bush outside. Just you wait. Dan w wondered how a stranger could get into the dorm, considering the front doors locked automatically from the outside. Could I have your attention, please? Dan recognized the director, or the director from the first couple of days. He had been all smiles then. Now he looked ragged, still humbled from sleep and shaken to the floor. If I could have your attention, he repeated, standing on the first step of the entranceway. The students quieted down and the police officers moved away. Thank you. All right. I know it's been a difficult night for everyone. First thing in the morning, your parents will be notified of the situation. Right now, we need to do what's best for you, our faculty, staff, and of course, what's best for Joe McCullen's family. The police will conduct a full search of the building tonight, and an officer will be stationed on each floor to make certain you are all safe. I'm sure many of you have questions, and I'm happy to st stay and assist you however I can. For the rest of you, be safe and vigilant. I'm just mad I And cooperate fully with the Camford police, and let us keep Joe's family in our thoughts tonight. At this, the sound of crying rippled through the crowd. In front of Dan, two girls clung to each other, sobbing. Students swarmed around the director, shouting questions until he ordered them to calm down and speak one by one. Dismissed by the policewoman, Abby walked over to Dan. I don't think she even wrote down half of what I said. Whatever, I'm so ready for bed, it's not even funny. Although I don't suppose there's any way I'm going to uh, fall asleep, she shuddered. I just wish this were a nightmare so that we could wake up from. Can I see you tomorrow? She shook his hand, squeezed it, and squeezed back. Yeah. Try to get some sleep. We'll talk tomorrow. Text if you need me. With heavy steps, Abby followed a police officer who was leading the students to a, a back staircase to their rooms. Since the main stairs were cordoned off, cordoned with police tape, the body had been moved, but for the time being, it was still a crime scene. Dan trudged up the stairs behind her, body exhausted, or beyond exhausted, wishing he had a moment to properly remember their kiss, to forget that he was a per at Brookline altogether. At Brookline, where a murderer was wandering free. My goodness, I cannot speak. Okay, so that was interesting. And I wonder is it a ghost? Is he haunting somebody? Like possessing someone? Did he never leave? Was he the warden? Did he become the warden afterward? Is he the director now? The sculptor, I mean. This kind of reminds me of uh, Five Nights at Freddy's, The Silver Eyes. We'll see We'll see just how it rates on the uh, supernatural scale. Um, hmm. so I don't think it's a ghost that did it. Anyway, let me know if you, uh, what you guys think of it. Uh, whether or not you agree with me, if you have some theories of your own, I need to find my lens off. I can't seem to find it anywhere. Anywho, until next time, goodbye everybody. I was going to say something else. Oh, uh, this is kind of important. Um, so there was this guy at work, he's been fired uh, recently, but he hated me for whatever reason, and I'm fairly certain uh, another guy from work was the reason for it. Anyway, the guy who I think was the reason for the co-worker who was fired, uh, uh, yeah, making that guy hate me, I'm fairly certain he's told that guy where I live, 
because yesterday when I went to work, um, went out to my car to go to work, uh, he and his friends were in their car waiting for me uh, to get in the car and drive by and just glare at me. Now, I don't, I don't really think they'd be up to anything, mostly because he's an idiot. But on the off chance they try something and uh, something happens, um, or if I just get to the point where I think something might happen, I might have to hold off on making videos for a while. Or if something does happen, I won't be able to. But uh, I'll have my brother Adam release a statement for you guys so that you guys will know what's going on if anything does happen, not that I think anything will. Um, just, just letting people know. Anyway, wish me luck.